graduates, family, friends, faculty, staff, and esteemed guests to the 2018 BFA and MFA School of Drama commencement. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jennifer Holmes and I'm the Associate Dean of the School of Drama. It is said there is an ancient curse May you live in interesting times. It was a curse because interesting times meant dangers and monsters roamed the countryside. You live in interesting times. People fear living in such interesting times, but artists do not. Rather, they embrace them. You all have to get us through these interesting times and find us a better future. There are monsters roaming the countryside, and your art can chase them away. We need creative and artistic minds like yours to get us through these interesting times and find us a better tomorrow. We are counting on you now to go into these interesting times and fight the good fights. Be brave, be honest, be truly you, and bring us all safely through these interesting times into a better tomorrow. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to introduce our faculty speaker, Shaylon Costello. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna free my neck. Uh, and find my feet. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, for the sake of being redundant, good afternoon and welcome to the commencement of the 2018 graduates of the MFA and BFA programs at the New School College of Performing Arts, Drama. <laughs> Family, friends, partners, teachers, collaborators, fellows in artistry and citizenship, it is an honor to stand here with and for you today. I am myself a graduate of the MFA program and am now a professor in the BFA. Still an actor, my equity card is proudly tucked in my wallet uh, in the back. Um, so the, the journey is vast and varied. It holds multitudes. Get ready. Uh, friends, family, um, systems of support that don't fit into a uh, tidy title. Uh, there might be moments of curiosity for you still. Uh, what have these wonders of the world been doing and how do they do it? How will they continue to do it? Skill, technique, a bomb faculty, <laughs> yes, um, heart and what I'd call uh, honest-to-goodness magic. It lies within the power of language and in the wealth of our imagination. Uh, the power to create, it's steeped within our walls. If you've been in one of our rooms, or our main stage, for example, you've seen it. A playwright's blank page becomes text. Our actors breathe those words to life. Our technologists and designers' curiosity make lush the landscape that our directors weave into a unique tapestry. This collaboration reveals each of our artists through the world of play. You, my friends, have made magic. You have this present and power of magic through language and collaboration to create your life. Speak it, write it, design it, imagine it, and imagine it, and imagine it, over and over again. These are the tools you have already weathered and refined gloriously. So I, I think I speak for all of your faculty in saying congratulations to the class of 2018, BFA and MFA. Good for you. And uh, now I am pleased to introduce our first uh, student graduate speaker, Avon Hutton. 
Cotton. Hi. Hello, good afternoon. Um, wow, this was gonna be five minutes straight of shout outs, but you all deserve better than that, so I'm gonna give you something better. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna start us off with a quote. People, millions of people who don't know you, never will know you, People who may try to kill you in the morning live in a darkness where if you have that funny, special thing that every artist can recognize and no artist can define, you have a responsibility to those people to lighten that darkness. And although the artist can do it, there is a price that he has to pay, which is the willingness to give up everything. You can only take if you're prepared to give, and giving is not a day at the bargaining counter. It is a total risk of everything, of you. That's what James Baldwin had to say about the artist's integrity in 1962. And I know it's really heavy, and no one really came here to be stirred up this afternoon, but <laughs> if 2018 has taught me anything thus far, it's that some real good can come from being a little stirred up. Yeah. <laughs> and if Mr. Baldwin has taught me anything, it's that I am nothing if not honest. So yes, my speech will be a warm send off for all of you and for myself, I know we need it, but it will also be an honest one. And in a world at a time like this where honesty is lacking, I feel like I, I owe you that at least. So you could ask me on any given day, what I want out of life, and I might say something as palatable and as pleasing or as likely as peace and contentment, but the true beauty of my learning here has taught me that when it comes right down to it, what I really want is a decent fight. I want to be able to stand on leveled ground with the people who don't know me, the people who may try to kill me in the morning and everyone else that Mr. Baldwin has reminded me that I'm responsible to, I wanna be able to stand in front of those people and share my light. When I'm that vulnerable in my fight, my art, and my beliefs, that's when I can say I'm a person of integrity. That's when I can say I'm fair. Because even today, when the fairness in people is so clearly fleeting and your faith in your political leaders is clearly fleeting, along with maybe your will to keep going, you have your integrity. That's your job. Whether it feels good or not, is, that's a concern of the luxurious, the faint of heart, and the failures. Your job requires light and dark spaces. Your job demands you not only preserve, protect, and nurture your integrity, but most importantly, that you share it. That's the work that your training has prepared you for. That's the line of work that the world calls you to do, and I'm just up here right now to remind you to go do it. So go write the play, play the scene, build the world, and hold a mirror up to it even when your arms ache. Congratulations, all of you. <laughs> Our next speaker is someone who I've grown to admire over my years here, someone who's been a, a collaborator and a person who's given us plenty, plenty of work. <laughs> someone we admire. So please welcome Ella Steinloff. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> Uh, thank you to the faculty and the administration for this immense opportunity. And thank you all so much for being here. It was about three weeks into our freshman year 
when I realized that our class wouldn't have the opportunity to be in a production or put up a show for at least six months. So, <laughs> because I thought I was so effortlessly brilliant, <laughs> I decided to take it upon myself to put up one of the first BFA creative cafes of the program, Titus Andronicus. <laughs> I would act as director, dramaturge, producer, stage manager, costume, and set designer. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Had I ever been in any of these positions before, ever in my life? No. But fine. I could do it. <laughs> I held auditions and felt totally comfortable casting 18 wonderfully talented actors, many of whom I am so happy to be looking out at today. Uh, 18. <laughs> 18 schedules, 18 bodies to costume, 18 humans for whom it was my responsibility to guide through this process. I remember so clearly sitting in our first read through, looking out on these 18, 18 year olds, trying hard to do the impossible. Impart wisdom I hadn't even learned myself. I was virtually alone at the helm of the ship, a ship I had absolutely no context for captaining. <laughs> it was terrifying and thrilling, and the process would become one of the most valuable learning experiences of my life so far. Uh, I should note that at my side the entire time was the wonderful Charlotte Durkee. Charlotte, <laughs> yeah. Um, Charlotte, I have no idea how you put up with me through that process and then continued to be my friend afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we had no idea what we were doing, uh, but we took our $250 budget. We bought a lot of fake blood and underwear at Party City and we put up a show. <laughs> uh, we did it. We really did it. And I will start by saying that I am incredibly proud. Each and every one of you was so wonderful. You put in so much time and so much work, but I look back on my behavior throughout that process and I can't help but cringe <laughs> because I was not a director. I was a dictator. I know now that I didn't put up that production for the sake of creating work together, for the sake of meaningful art or telling an important story. I put up that show to prove I could do it. That's who I was at that time, and I am so thankful for that because there has been so much room to grow from there. <laughs> Daniel Goleman once said, self-absorption in all its forms kills empathy, let alone compassion. When we focus on ourselves, our world contracts as our problems and preoccupations loom large. But when we focus on others, our world expands. Fast forward to this past year, in the throes of creating my senior thesis project, I had built a team. A truly committed team of artists whose work I was committed to showcasing as their work within the context of the production. Once again at my side sat Charlotte as the phenomenally talented projection designer that she has become. And as we sat in a production meeting one morning talking about costumes and set and wider goals, she looks at me with a smile and says, Titus? <laughs> she rocked my world. I realized that I had taken a parallel $250 budget, a parallel aesthetic vision, a parallel passion, but was now working with newfound compassionate action. In the wise words of Ernest Hemingway, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is in being superior to your former self. That kind of nobility comes from learning to ask questions, learning to ask for help, and learning how to say, I don't know. The difference between the person I was when putting up Titus and who I am today is that I now understand that a show isn't just about me. It's about the actors and the designers and the production team and all of the unique qualities that make up their work and how those qualities come together to create a piece of art. Today, I am no longer a proud artist. I am an artist that I am proud of. Each and every person in this room is an artist in their own right. It is one thing to learn about art, to learn about what it is to create art, but at some point, those teachings become platitudes. Until you live it, until you get up and create, you cannot know what it is to create work that isn't about you. Your work will always be yours but it is your duty to take what is yours and share it, 
to its fullest and most generous extent with others. And the new school has set up the perfect conditions for us to realize that this work is so much bigger than us. We have had the space and the foundations to take conditions that are not natural to what we expect or what we necessarily want and be ourselves within that. To find our individual voices and talents and niches in the greater scheme of theater making. We sometimes may not like it. It may not be what we expect. I came into this program as an actor and then had the space to realize that my passion lies in directing. I, and most of the people here today, have been able to take what we came here with and expand and grow our talents into new mediums through surprising and eye-opening journeys. And we are not done growing. This graduation day is not only a moment to celebrate completion, this is a moment to celebrate new beginnings. We are not complete, nor should we strive to be so. Let us treat incompleteness as a verb and do our very best to never finish learning to continue to understand ourselves in new ways and in new expressions, to build our teams and trust ourselves and our cohorts in ways we never could have realized before. In her work, Eros, The Bittersweet, Anne Carson writes, to be running breathlessly but not yet arrived is itself delightful, a suspended moment of living hope. And so as we leave here today, I hope we all keep running and radically relish in the unknown. Thank you. And now please join me in welcoming Karina Bellini, our first MFA student speaker to the stage. Hey. Hello there. Um, thank you everyone for joining us on this really rainy day to celebrate the class of 2018. Let's give them a round of applause. And I want to thank my lovely mother for being here because she is the one that told me to come to grad school. Um, <laughs> throughout my grad school career, there were two orders my mother gave me. Primero. Karina, por favor, do not make me one of your protagonists. I know I am fascinating, but chica, por favor, do not write about me. I know she's out there getting nervous. She's like, ay, Karina, no, por, please, please. And two, Karina, when you get your master's, Tell them it was me who told you to dive into your dreams. <laughs> a week before I started grad school, I had made the decision to not attend. I had grew up with a single mother and five other siblings struggling to fit the American dream in small Brooklyn apartments. A master's in playwriting seemed impossible. As an adult, I found stability teaching full time with a 401k. It scared me to risk that peace of mind for my dream. But my mother pulled me aside and she said, Ay, mija, peace of mind? That's sleeping through life. And so I dove dove myself into this brilliant cohort who have here, who like me, this life has chosen them. Mommy, I came to school for you, but I stayed in school because of my classmates. For my playwriting brothers and sisters, I have waited my whole life to sit at a table with you three. Christian and his psychoanalysis Papi Chulo Powers <laughs> knew what he was doing when he put us four together. He knew that although we are timid by nature, we find power on paper. That we write out of survival and for invisibility. We would be family. 
we had bared our souls to each other, watched each other immortalize our parents for the stage, I'm sorry, mommy, you already know, <laughs> call truce with inner demons, sorry, play God when we felt the most home hopeless, we navigated through personal tragedies together and cried in a way you only cry in front of your mother. But as Laura Maria Sensabella says, if you are not crying through it, you are not doing it right. And she is absolutely right. I will miss you three. The American theater is lucky to have Nick's poetics, Blake's magical realism, and Erica's funny and feminism. <laughs> For my directors, a social justice superhero, a renaissance woman, a sensuality expert, <laughs> and a big heart that left the enchanted island for un forever in Nueva York. Thank you for your leadership and unwavering strength even during your own grad school growing pains. And for the actors, I'm sorry you guys, my word counts, you shapeshifters and soakers of the written world, word. Even in the deepest depths of your exhaustion, you have brought life to every class and rehearsal. I am amazed by your empathy. The way you've captured so many human lives flawlessly without ever placing judgment. You have given the playwright such gifts. When I felt the most invisible, you brought the people I love to life. We have all sacrificed so much to be here, and now we graduate. Re-enter worlds that are no longer the same. We will be in between shows, in between writer's block and fluidity, a rock and a hard place. You may want peace. You may want the safety of 401ks, but you are already the American dream because you live life with purpose, because nobody illuminates the human experience better than you. So continue to sacrifice, so you can put a mirror up to the wall, world, dismantle the demigods, challenge administrations, teach people how to dance soca, break <laughs> glass ceilings, and make brown, black lives matter to everyone. <laughs> Remember your perseverance these last three years. I will remember it. My mother was right. Theater and you, class of 2018, were worth wrecking my peace for. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce the next speaker, the wonderful and really talented Xiao Tian. Dear Dean Pippin Parker, <laughs> faculty and staff, parents, friends, and fellow graduates, good afternoon and congratulations. My name is Xiao Tian Tai. I'm deeply honored and grateful to speak at the School of Drama Commencement for the class of 2018. Thank you very much. I would love to use my time here today to share with you two quotes that I heard during my new school for drama life. One in the form of a statement, 
the other in the form of a recurring question. With their associated contests, these two quotes have spurred my thinking and transformed who I am as an artist and a person. The first quote took place in the first semester in Professor Catherine Roster's acting class. Now, before that class, I thought the reason why I could get into an MFA program was because I was good. <laughs> My acting had worked in those auditions. So from day one, with genuine pride and all good intent, I started to bring all those past habits and means of acting anew into the classroom. The stuff that brought me glories, peak experiences, and previous successes. However, not only a lot of those old tricks were not seem to be working anymore. <laughs> I was also getting frequently called out on all <laughs> aspects of acting. I was not listening truthfully, I was playing ideas. <laughs> I was asking to myself, but not to my partners. Those days felt bad. <laughs> because suddenly I don't know what should I do on stage anymore. It seemed that I was even regressing. Frustration and confusion overwhelmed me. I could not stop doubting myself. It was around that time when Professor Ruster said to us, the first quote, that the study of acting here is a three-year process. At first, you take a step back, then two steps forward at the end of the year. You may then take another half step back at the beginning of year two, but followed by three steps forward before it ends. It is kind of how it works. <laughs> now, I did, not, I did not realize that it was so true until I entered the third year. Now, looking back, it was very much like what Professor Roster predicted. Knots, frustrations, and confusions kept creating bottlenecks. Then with persistent trying and reflection, at a certain moment of time, I did pass through each one of them, grew out of the old comfort zones, and entered a new level of, of ability. It is when I understood the importance of giving permission to let the process do its work. To have patience to let the transformation happen with the confidence that it will eventually happen. Because transformation takes time. Qualitative change requires lasting energy. Of course, I got to always work hard and keep finding paths, but it's, it is not at all but it is not at all pessimistic to accept that the process itself has its role too. And there will naturally be ups and downs. There will be moments where working from pre previous methodology is not effective anymore. It is important to accept that and be able to sit on some struggles for a while. Because later, after taking one step back, I may be led to a crosswalk where I will find a way to advance two steps forward. The second quote is a question that I have heard in its virings from Professor Scott Whitehurst to Professor Peter J. Fernandez and basically all the teachers. <laughs> it is a question usually asked by them after I do a show or come out of a long rehearsal. Are you having fun? <laughs> I feel truly blessed to be reminded by this question constantly at the new school. You know, because I usually do not want to upset the person um, who asked me this question. <laughs> no. So no matter how exhausting the experience was, I would always say, yes, I'm having fun. <laughs> But as an actor, I was told that you know, I need to be truthful. So in order to make that yes truthful, I needed to find evidence <laughs> and tell them what was fun. 
So I began to go back and really look for things that were enjoyable. And when I began to appreciate something, that thing appreciated itself. I have found, no matter how small, joys among the pains. I changed the focal point, and the whole experience appeared another way. This question has kept reminding me to find the fun in the work, because maybe the fun is the work. Happiness from the artists can provide a sustainable creative energies for themselves. And on site, the sense of joy from performer might actually be able to magically create a more fluid, perf perf uh, fluid performance environment, making the audience want to take the performance in and transform it into, into sustenance they need. Newsweek has also reminded me that it is not shameful to be happy. <laughs> there may be some transformation of resources, some giving up on what no longer works, but we do not need to purely sacrifice to be where we want. We do not need to suffer to be happy. Better choices are better choices. Love is love, and fun is fun. <laughs> it has been quite a three-year journey here at the New School. With these two quotes and many other wisdoms, I've been learning and growing every day. And now I'm ready to, like most of you, go into society. <laughs> and do what I have always been wanting to do. So at the end, I deeply wish you to have a wonderful career and life by allowing patience for transformation and accountability for fun. Thank you. And now it is an honor to introduce the next wonderful student speaker, my three-year three friend and wonderful peer, the New School for Drama Directing MFA, India, India Marie Paul. first congratulate everyone on their hard work, blood, sweat, tears, meltdowns, and existential crises that we have survived to get here today. <laughs> yes. Over these three or four years, we have put our hearts and souls into the pursuit and creation of storytelling through theater, and I can officially say we've done it. We are on the other side now, and for that, congratulations. We have spent countless hours and cups of coffee learning how. But as we look ahead at the cups of coffees to come, I hope we set aside time to ponder why. Why spend so much time telling stories and getting into debt? Why, spending <laughs> yeah. why spend hours crafting the perfect dialogue, pretending to be someone else, or figuring out the best place to stand in a room? Everyone, everyone will and should. <laughs> Yes, it's very hard. Uh, <laughs> everyone will and should find their own answer to this question, but I would like to share a little of my journey to the why. It started in a Shakespeare class, very original, I know, um, taught by the wonderful Scott Whitehurst. He passed out a piece of paper with Hamlet's advice to the players, and it impacted me so much that I bought a little card that I keep with the text in my wallet. I, wonder, I won't read the entire thing, though I do recommend it, but I want to read you a sentence that became my launching point. The purpose of playing, whose end both at the first and now was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. I believe that theater's greatest power is to instill and teach empathy for another human being or experience you may not have been able to otherwise 
To breathe and exist in the same space and time with an audience forces a connection between the storyteller and the observer in a way that no other medium, in my opinion, can compete with. It is then put on us, the theater artist, to hold the mirror up to our world and to expose its flaws, its beauty, and everything in between in hopes that someone in that audience will recognize themselves and go back into the world a little more aware and a little kinder. Jane Goodall wisely said, what you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. If you have spent any time looking at the news, it can seem like the only thing in the mirror are the flaws, and it's very easy to get discouraged. I ask you to take a deep breath and never give up hope. By being in this room today, we have already started our journey to creating a better future for those to come. We have chosen to be a graduate from a school that challenged us to be better as an artist and as a person, to never accept that the world we came into must be the same world we leave behind. So why do I trudge through the hills and valleys of the entertainment industry? Why do I want to tell stories in a world that doesn't always want to listen? It's because I've learned to believe in the change theater can create in the world, and we all have become the gatekeepers of that change. Not everyone will agree with my why, and that in itself is beautiful. I hope every single one of you finds your why and goes forth into life after graduation, not just with a degree, but with a purpose. I wish success for us all, and I wish that in our failures we find our strength. I wish endless strength, and when the weight becomes unbearable, I wish us the knowledge that we will never be alone. I wish us voices that scream past the hate, plenty of tea to soothe our sore throats, and coffee to keep us going. To quote Shaw, we are made wise not by the recollection of our past, but by the responsibility for our future. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pippin Parker. I'm the Dean of the School of Drama and the Associate Dean of the College of Performing Arts. It's my pleasure to welcome you here and to um, Avon and Ella and Karina <coughs> Xiao Chen and uh, India, I thank you so much for representing uh, your fellow students. I could not be more um, proud of you and um, just really wonderful to hear your uh, speaking here today and thinking back when you, uh, when you guys all started your journey with us. Um, it's, um, I have a real privilege now, if I can find my notes. The privilege is in here, but the notes are here. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> Kathleen Shelfont began working as a production coordinator, this is hard to believe, a production coordinator at Playwrights Horizon in the mid-70s. She made her off-Broadway acting debut in 1974 and has appeared since then in dozens, perhaps scores, I don't know, hundreds of <laughs> off-Broadway and Broadway productions. She was nominated for the 1993, uh, 1993 Tony Award as Best Actress in Tony Kushner's Angel in America Millennium Approaches. <laughs> She earned the Outer Circles, uh, Circle Critics, the Drama Desk, the Obie, and Lucille T L Lortel Awards for her performance as Vin Vivian Baring in Margaret Edson's Pulitzer Prize winning play, Wit, in 1998. <clears throat> for which she famously shaved her head, which was way before that was cool. Um, for her 2003 performance in Alan Bennett's Talking Heads, she won a second Obie Award. In 2004, she was honored with the uh, Lucille Lortel Edith Oliver Award for Sustained Excellence. In 2009, Kathleen performed in The People Speak, a documentary film utilizing dramatic and musical performances of the letters, diaries, and speeches of everyday Americans based on the uh, book by the uh, historian Howard Zinn, the book A People's History of the United States. And she has spoken widely about the role of art and artists in advocating for civil rights and social justice issues. Um, and as she calls it, theater as a platform for social change. She has hosted, uh, she has been hosted by the Center for Constitutional Rights as part of the Guantanamo Lawyers Panel. Uh, 
and has uh, additionally is a founding member, this is so crazy, founding member of the Women's Project. And by the way, I'm skipping all of, over all the television and film stuff. I'm just getting to the good stuff. Um, uh, sits on the board the Vineyard Theater, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS, the advisory board of the New York Foundation for the Arts. She was an artist in residence at the Weill College of Medicine of Cornell University from 2005 and 6. was a uh, Beinecke Fellow at uh, Yale School of Drama and was a member of the Board of Advisors of um, Doctors Without uh, Borders. Medecins Sans Frontières, and um, was awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Cooper Union in 2010. She's looking at her watch now. I'm not eating into your time. Um, later this month, I think on the 21st, she will be receiving a special Obie Award for lifetime achievement. Very well earned. Essentially, Kathy, if this were England, you would already have been knighted. You would be yes. Dame Commander Kathy of the Empire. Um, it's my thrill and privilege to uh, introduce my favorite dame, Kathleen Chalfant. Yes. Thanks, Pippin. I, um, three years ago, four, I was tricked into teaching here. <laughs> I said I would never do it. And, and here I am, and I won't go away now. And one of the great perks of uh, having been tricked into teaching here is that I get to know so many of you. Um, this, uh, these speakers that have come before are um, astonishingly hard act to follow, and I am so happy to welcome all of you as colleagues. <clears throat> um, it is both a pleasure and an honor to be asked to usher in your commencement. You're all just about to commence, and I commenced a long time ago, and I'm still at it. When thinking what I might say today, it occurred to me that it might be useful to sketch out what shapes your lives might possibly take in this profession you're about to enter, which is a very long profession. The job, as I see it, is pretty much what Shakespeare and almost all of the speakers suggested, to hold a mirror up to nature. This mirror holding can take many forms and it can occur on many scales. For some of you, it will be a long life of storytelling and for some, just a short one. For some, it will be a quick, giddy, wild ride to fame and fortune and for some, a long journey up and down and roundabout in small places and big places, telling important or maybe not so important things <laughs> to tiny audiences and sometimes gigantic audiences. And for some, it will be only the first thing you try before moving on to a completely different life than the one you're contemplating now. But while you're doing it, the world will be full of the unexpected because, as you know, for the actors, you spend your life pretending to be somebody else. And for the writers, you spend your lives inventing new worlds. And for the directors, your job is to hack your way through the underbrush and lead the rest of us to the end of the trail. Quite often, when you imagine that nothing is happening, it's good to have a look in your bag or your purse or wherever you keep your stuff. I did that a few weeks back, and here's what I found. A copy of T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, and thank God a book explaining them. <laughs> <clears throat> The Yale Shakespeare edition of the sonnets that my brother Alan, my, my glamorous gay older brother Alan, who's the reason that I'm here, gave to me when I was 11. 
the script for a new play by Kuzi Cram about St. Vincent's Hospital, and the directions to Seth Rudetsky's radio show on Sirius FM, uh, where I was scheduled to talk about the Shakespeare Sonnet Slam in Central Park. And this was on a day when I was feeling quite gloomy, because I just had two auditions for jobs I really wanted, and had heard I'd gotten either one of them. And had I got either or both of those jobs, I wouldn't have been able to do the jobs that those things in my purse were for. And then the next day, someone asked me to do the soundtrack for a tiny little movie about a remarkable woman who was a heroine in the Second World War. And a couple days later, I did a reading of a play by Rebecca Gilman about Mabel Loomis Todd, who was the mistress of Emily Dickinson's brother, Austin, an affair consummated in Emily Dickinson's front parlor while Miss Dickinson rode all unawares, or maybe not, upstairs. <laughs> And Mabel Loomis Todd was also the editor of the first published edition of Emily Dickinson's poems and founded the Hog Island Nature Conservancy and wrote a book about total eclipses of the sun. And oh, by the way, that play is going to happen at 59 East 59 in the month of November. So you see, anything can happen. You could be walking down the street and be stopped by somebody you know a little and asked to be in a workshop of a play that becomes Angels in America. Oh, but there's phones. Do you got your phone? That happens too all the time. <laughs> and then you have to figure out what to do about it. And now we all have them. Anyway. Or you can spend your entire life being a teaching artist in a school, in a place where you provide the only safe place for people who are not like everyone else. And so spread the gospel that art is not an amenity for the privileged, but the essential expression of the human soul and a lifeline, the thing that will keep us from plunging into the abyss. This work is intensely personal and essentially communal. It doesn't exist, really, until it's seen or felt or heard or maybe even touched. We do it for the community, the audience, whether it's ghost stories around a campfire, grand opera, huge musicals, plays with only a voice or lips or footfalls, plays that make you laugh so hard you can't stand it, or sob from the depths of your being, and that's only the live action part. We also have movies and television and all the mysterious platforms in cyberspace and God knows what's coming, holograms, I don't know. But the great bulk of my work has been in the theater. And I have always thought that putting on a play is a perfect microcosm of a successful society. It requires collaboration, discipline, compromise, the pursuit of excellence, the pursuit of beauty, facing terror, deferred gratification, faith, hope, charity, wonder, and lots of hard work undertaken together with and for others. There is an essential job for every single member of the community, from the leading actor to the person who tears the tickets. And finally, what you produce, all this work and its results, exists only with the participation, with the collaboration of the entire community for whom it is made. All these things undertaken by individuals in and for the community. And so we come to what seems to me to be our responsibility. Because the pleasure we get from this work is so astonishing when it goes well. I mean, what's better than laughs or applause or tears or getting paid, sometimes a lot, sometimes not so much, <laughs> for doing the thing that you love more than anything? Because of that, I think that all of us at one time or another wonder if we shouldn't maybe be spending our time bringing clean water to children who don't have any. If you can do that better than what you are doing, it's worth thinking about very seriously. 
but I think there is a chance that the skills you have all learned provide ways to give back and to, in some part, fulfill our immense responsibility to each other and this world we inhabit together. I, I want to mention here some of your colleagues, the kids in the drama department at Parkland High School, Cynthia Nixon, Stephanie Clifford, Robert Redford, Glenda Jackson, all of them are using their gifts for the greater good. Those Parkland kids, you know, were accused of being crisis actors, as if they were somehow flown in by the evil left-wing conspiracy where they'd been trained in some underground facility. But no, <laughs> actually, most of them were rehearsing for a production of Spring Awakening in their public high school drama program. And that is what prepared them to galvanize the nation and maybe, just maybe, do something about the American gun madness. Cynthia Nixon, who as a private citizen has fought for the public schools for a long time, has now, as Glenda Jackson did many years ago, walked away from an enormously successful and fulfilling career to run for office and is using not only the gift of celebrity, but more tellingly, her gifts of empathy, connection, clarity of thought, and speech, and analysis, and oh yes, she's funny too. <laughs> All those things come from a life of getting inside the words and souls of other people. And we must not forget that Stephanie Clifford, who in The New Yorker is properly identified as an adult film actress and director, has surprised a lot of people by her combination of courage and command of the language and the microphone. Robert Redford spent more of the last few years in front of congressional microphones than in front of movie cameras doing everything he can to save us for ourselves. And oh yes, you can go home again because we have the great gift of Glenda Jackson back on the stage in Three Tall Women, and there is an argument to be made that what she is doing now is as important for the greater good as what she did so fiercely for all those years in Parliament. And so, back to the theater, qua theater is a transformative force. There are organizations like the 52nd Street Project, the Epic Theater Center with its teaching artists and Shakespeare Remix, countless literary programs, staff, literacy programs staffed by actors. Shakespeare in the parking lot. The WIT initiative that took the play WIT to most of the major teaching hospitals in the country as a tool for teaching young doctors about life and death and love and palliative care. And oh yes, the writers, Eve Ensler, whose work has made us see so many things, not just vaginas in a new way. Ellen McLaughlin, who has transformed the great Greek plays to illuminate our time. Tony Kushner, who made Prior Walter everyone's son for those seven hours and for so many hours beyond that. Annie Baker, who makes magic out of the absolutely ordinary over and over again. Dale Orlander Smith and Anna DeVere Smith, who both bring back stories from the front lines. Susan Laurie Parks, who tells the myths of our time. Lin-Manuel Miranda and Chiara Alegria Hudis, who write plays about what America really looks like, not some prelapsarian white utopia that never existed. <coughs> And more, so many more. Oh yeah, there are lots of women in that list, but you know, time's up. <laughs> we get into people's heads and hearts, and so we must think what is the best way to use this power. There, a very strange thing happens when you're on TV because you come into people's homes, your image sometimes lodges in that place in the brain where friends and acquaintances are stored, and you find yourself stopped on the street by people who think they know you. That is a very powerful phenomenon, one to consider carefully, one the consequences of which we are all living with now. 
So, any or all of these things might happen to you. These are perilous times. But you all have great possibilities and talents to use to help the rest of us through. And two final things. The first is be kind. And the second is vote as often as they give you a chance. <laughs> There is just no one who was given the incredible combination of integrity and joy as Kathy Shawfont. I'm just so, um, so grateful to you for being here today for us. I um, also want to take this opportunity to introduce to you, not to you guys because you know them, but to others here who may not be so familiar with our uh, fantastic uh, staff and faculty. Um, from going down the line, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Professor Glynis Rigsby, who is the <laughs> program director of the BFA. <laughs> William Cusick, who's the uh, department head of Creative Technologies. Lucy, Lucy Thurber, the great Lucy Thurber, department head playwriting. <laughs> Stephen Brown Freed, co-head of the uh, directing department. Taya Alajik, co-head of the directing department. Shay Costello, who you met earlier. and my um, pal and associate dean, Jennifer Holmes. But now here's the important part. Um, if I could ask Glynis to come up and we will start with the presentation of the graduates and Jennifer too. <laughs> As your name is called, you can stand and come on stage. Mariam Alton Baeva. <laughs> Liam Broadhurst. <laughs> Hunter Cagle. <laughs> Jordan Cooper. <laughs> Joseph Dardano. Taylor Del Priori. Charlotte Durkee. Judith Edland. Sarah Gens. Lamine Leroy Jiba. Ray Haas. Oh, Renee Harrison. Avon Houghton. <laughs> Olivia Perko. Andrew Hunter. Yoko Kuratani. Melissa Maney. Sarah Martinez. Jesse Meckel. Logan Middleton. Kimber Monroe. <laughs> Marina Montesanti. Tasneem Natari. Sarah 
Nelson. Haley Olmstead. Daniel Perez. Miranda Poet. Maria Radulescu. Evan Reed. Evelyn Rivera Cardenas. Ella Steinloff. Lily Stiefel. Bella Stockdale. Victoria Tamez. Ilana Tyrell. Congratulations. Um, writers next. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, oh, Lucy, I need you to hand that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Next up, we have our MFA writers. <laughs> Karina Bellini. Blake Bishton. Nikhil Mahapatra. Erica Mann. And next we have our MFA directors. Peter Quo. Andreas Lopez Alicea. Nikki Maggio. India Marie Paul. And last, but definitely not least, we have our MFA actors. <laughs> Jessica Betancourt. <laughs> Brett Bazard. <laughs> Renee Michelle Brunet. <laughs> Xiao Cheng Ka. Jonathan Kremeni. Rose Dolezal. William Donovan. Moira Kayingi. Jillian Macklin. Alexandra Merritt Matthews. Claire McLean. Miranda Powers. And Matthew Scott. Congratulations, graduates.
So, yes. So one of the dangers of speaking last, of course, is that everything's already been said and said much, much better. <clears throat> and I always find myself frantically cutting a bunch of shit out. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, I did want to take, just before we um, celebrate with our uh, mid-priced Prosecco and domestic cheese in a minute, um, I did want to say a couple words. So when I was growing up, and to give you an idea how long ago this was, it was before uh, Instagram and uh, <laughs> DMs. Um, and uh, actually, we did have direct messaging, but it was, we called it um, talking. Um, <laughs> so way back in this previous century, <clears throat> uh, my brothers and sisters and I, and there were a, a, a lot of us, um, we had to get up at six in the morning uh, to practice our instruments. And I played, uh, briefly for a while, I played viola, and um, a couple of my, yes, it's, it, there's always only one of us. Um, <laughs> um, I played viola, a couple of my sisters played violin, someone played clarinet, and um, we'd all be up before school and before breakfast and uh, practicing, uh, uh, practicing away. And, um, and let me just say, we were not what you might call prodigies. Um, in fact, I think the general effect was something like the sound of the monthly meeting of the Cats in Heat Club. Um, and, um, but I remember my mother had, um, for years, this quotation sort of handwritten, taped over her desk uh, it was on, a, on this piece of paper. And um, it was by, um, I believe it's a quote by uh, Itzhak Perlman, um, although it may have been Isaac Stern. Um, you can kind of insert your own famous Jewish violin player, you know, <laughs> Yudi Menwin or, I don't know, Model Comsoil, anyway. Um, <laughs> And the quote was this, every great artist starts out as a nuisance. <laughs> so parents, <laughs> I first of all want to acknowledge each of you and thank you for the forbearance and for the patience uh, that you've extended your child throughout the nuisance years and for allowing them to emerge on the other side as artists. I know you've spent a lot of time in anxious joy um, watching your child, encouraging them, supporting them, sitting in the audi audience and applauding them. And so if you don't mind, I would um, just like to turn that around for a moment and have all of the parents stand so we could applaud you for a change. We really, really thank you deeply and, um, and uh, take with great um, honor and responsibility um, the work that you've done and sort of handing off your um, children or young adults to us. Um, and of course, supportive parents are only one part of the equation. The other part is the teachers. And at the School of Drama, I mean, we have I run out of um, adjectives and adverbs, but we have an, a, an incredible faculty who are deeply, deeply invested in creating a program that is rigorous and relevant and helps guide and really divine the student's authentic artistry and sense of self. And I just cannot thank them enough for their work. Uh, it's um, amazing and it makes my job so um, so easy and so inspiring and so fun. And um, their 
their expertise, their commitment, their belief in our community is just absolutely sustaining. And um, so I would also like them to stand for a moment so we could thank you properly. And then there's this sort of kind of behind the scenes group team uh, making sure that this whole flying machine of a dream we have going on stays in the air and that the wings don't fall off and the engine doesn't die. And uh, I think it's important to uh, recognize them as well. Some of them um, interact a huge amount with students and are absolutely at the center of everything we do. Some of them are um, are doing equally important work and only intersecting with our students or our faculty from time to time. But um, if I may, um, Octavia and the whole production department, which <laughs> allow us to do what we do. And to um, Sam and Marlon and Amanda in the admissions office. Uh, and to Kesley, our new uh, academic advisor, and to <laughs> and to Rachel Francois, who is our beloved Rachel Francois who has returned to the fold, thank you so much. And Bob Hoyt in the professional development office. Emerson Brathwaite, of course. Rachel Christensen, or better known, I think to the BFA is that nice lady to whom you must turn in your receipts or you won't graduate. Our amazing general manager, Jessica Cochran. And um, my colleague and co-conspirator, Jennifer Holmes, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. And then there's a whole other group of people who we are meeting with all the time to figure out what is the best way, how can we keep doing this, and what are the um, the essential elements that we need in order to survive um, week to week. And, and I particularly want to recognize a, a group who are fundamental to what we do at the School of Drama, and that is to um, recognize Valerie Foyer and Bill Gustafson and Maggie Couser and Julie Groob uh, and uh, uh, my colleague and a co-associate Dean Keller um, Coker, and of course, um, our, all of our boss and our biggest supporter, um, the executive dean of the College of Performing Arts, uh, Richard Kessler. Thank you so much. To give you an idea of how supportive they are, I ran into them right before I was, before I was gonna come on stage and they uh, surrounded me and Richard Kessler pulled the stays from his own collar and they put his stays in my collar and dressed me and I think they were like, what the fuck is the matter with you not knowing how to bring stays on an important day like this? Your collar's all over the place, it's crazy. So I thank you, I'm just, uh, I mean, it's an amazing team that we have and uh, I mean, I'm really, uh, uh, every day excited to come to work. Um, not so much at the end of the day, not necessarily every day, but every day in the morning, <laughs> I am excited to come to work. I'm gonna cut a bunch of stuff because it's been said so much better, but I do say uh, 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 there are a couple of things. And I think that one thing is that, you know, we talk about the power of theater um, to heal and to provoke. And, you know, as they used to say about journalism, if you remember journalism, that was back in the old days, <laughs> journalism, <clears throat> um, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. 
And, and so I started, and I was thinking about that, and I was also thinking about being a nuisance. And I think there's a whole other side of being a nuisance. So I think maybe you start off as a nuisance, and then you train, and then you kind of de-nuisance yourself for a while until you get good enough to be a nuisance again. And I actually think to be a nuisance, to provoke people, is an incredibly important aspect of the work that we do. Um, so you're in now your second nuisance um, and, um, and it's really, uh, it's really kind of amazing. And I, I'm, I'm, I feel utterly confident that you are, because of the work that you've done, that you are armed with everything that you're going to need uh, to do this work. And part of that is because you, each of you has been asking this very powerful question over the last few years that we would think about all the time, and that is the question of what if. All of our work depends upon asking ourselves what if, what if. And that is really the history of, of art, um, an activity that you are now engaged in. And, you know, we can say, you know, what if these two kids from houses both alike but uh, shared in ancient grudges were to fall in love, right? You know, what if the king of Thebes married his mother? Um, <laughs> you know, what if Aaron Burr could rap? These what ifs are things that we use to kind of recognize a kind of essential human in each of us. It's a modest kind of light that we're given as artists. And individually, we, we can use it to sort of illuminate some contours and bring, let things sort of emerge from the dark. But I think the other thing that I've become more and more aware of in working with all of you is the power of a group of people armed with that modest light. So that that becomes something much, much more powerful. You know, so it's what if, say, a group of actors and writers and designers, if you're smart, a stage manager. I highly recommend a stage manager. <clears throat> if they can gather, that group can gather that light and focus it and align it, really remarkable things can happen. And part of that light is warmth, and part of we're attracted to light, but that light can also provoke. That light can be a nuisance. That light can, um, it, it, it is, as Leonard Cohen told us, what gets in through the cracks. And people aren't always gonna be happy, and that's okay. Because as long as your aim is towards the truth, your work will sustain. You will be on a course that, that, that is true and is, um, doing the work that we, that we need done. And I don't think there is a time in my life that it has been more essential, and I think Kathy and all of the student speakers were alluding to this, there has not been a time where it's more important for you to feel confident and powerful and true about your, um, about your aim, about applying your work, and um, using your imagination and your compassion and your empathy, your creativity, your determination, your resiliency to, um, to help bend your history and our history towards justice. If you wanna throw a few laughs in along the way, that's also really helpful, we like that. <laughs> laughs are good. I'm so um, privileged to be in the position that I'm in. I talk to a lot of people who have been completely wrung out by, what, by what's going on in the country and in the world. My friends overseas, similar, similarly despairing. And I have this incredible, seemingly limitless reservoir of optimism that is you guys. You students, every day I come to work and I am happy to report out to my friends across the world that hope is on the way. And you are that hope. 
I'm so proud of each of you, of what you have accomplished, and what you are going to accomplish. And I, speaking on behalf of all of us up here, just am enchanted and cannot wait to see what happens next with you guys. Congratulations so much. I think what happens now is that the graduates rise. And we will cue the music and we will um, see you guys later. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs>